this series um, of look at the work of the people who've worked in the Capitol is enriched today by the vision of two gentlemen who have worked together for a long time, uh, James Edward Risen and his son, Tom Risen, who have banded together to write a book called The Last Honest Man about Senator Frank Church. We were going to look at his, Senator Church had an interesting, an interesting challenge um, and met it with courage um, to really look at the abuse of power by the CIA, by the FBI, the role of the mafia, and what was going on with the Kennedys. Senator Church was an unlikely hero. He led the opposition to the Vietnam War and had become a scathing and radical crit critic of what he saw as American imperialism around the world. But he was still very politically ambitious, privately yearning for acceptance from the foreign policy establishment that he hated and eager to run for president. Despite his flaws, Church showed historic strength in his greatest moment when in the wake of Watergate, he was all of a sudden tasked with investigating abuses of power in the intelligence community. The dark truths that Church exposed from assassination plots by the CIA to links between the Kennedy dynasty and the mafia to the surveillance of civil rights activists by the NSA and the FBI would shake the nation to its very core and forever changed the way that Americans thought about not only our government, but also about their ability to hold it accountable. This book draws upon hundreds of interviews, thousands of pages of recently declassified documents and realms of unpublished letters, notes, and memoirs, some of which remain sensitive even today um, Pulitzer Prize winning reporter James Risen tells the gripping untold story of truth and integrity standing against unchecked power and winning in The Last Honest Man. Mr. Risen, who's given me permission to call him Jim, is a best selling author and the former New York Times reporter is now the Intercept Senior National Security Correspondent based here in Washington, DC. He also serves as director of the First Looks Media Press Freedom Defense Fund, dedicated to supporting news organizations, journalists, and whistleblowers in legal fights in which a substantial public interest, freedom of the press, or related human or civil rights is at stake. He himself, was a target of the US government's crackdown on journalists and whistleblowers. He waged a seven year battle risking jail after the Bush administration and later the Obama administration sought to force him to testify and reveal his confidential sources in a leak investigation. Risen never gave in and the government finally backed down. As a New York Times reporter, Mr. Risen won the 2006 Pulitzer Prize winning for national reporting for his stories about the National Security Agency's domestic spying program. And he was a member of the reporting team that won the 2002 Pro Pulitzer Prize for explanatory reporting for coverage of the September 11th attack and uh, terrorism. He began his career in the Midwest at Fort Wayne Journal Gazette later at the Miami Herald, the Detroit Free Press, and the Los Angeles Times. So he knows this country well. He joined the New York Times in 1998, where he remained until the summer of 2017. He's the author of four books and has now recruited his son, Thomas Reiser, who is a journalist in his own right. Uh, who has reported on US politics, national security, and the intelligence community, digital surveillance, and the war on terror. His first book as a co-author is the book we're talking about today, The Last Honest Man, the CIA, the FBI, the mafia, and the Kennedys, one senator's fight to save democracy. He also contributed research and interviews 
for the book's State of War and the Secret History of the CIA and the Bush Administration, and for Pay at Any Price, Greed, Power, and the Endless War. So, Mr. Risen, Mr. Risen, Tom and Jim, we look forward to your conversation and teach us about Senator Frank Church, one of the unsung heroes of the United States Congress. And then we will join in Q&A. Carry on. Okay, thank you very much uh, for that very kind uh, introduction. Uh, I, uh, I'm Jim Risen, and uh, Tom and I, uh, as Jane just said, uh, co-authored The Last Honest Man, um, which uh, was published uh, in 2023, and the paperback is coming out in uh, May of this year. So um, we're very proud of the book. I think the uh, key reason that I wanted to write about this book, and I think Tom as well, uh, was because um, the phrase, the church committee, has become part of the American political lexicon. If you uh, today, whenever there's a major crisis or scandal in Washington, people say we need a new church committee, uh, both Democrats and Republicans. Uh, when there was torture uh, that needed to be investigated under Bush, people said we need a new church committee. Uh, now the Republicans who uh, hated Frank Church and hated the original church committee. Now, whenever they they um, want to investigate what they call the woke government, they say we need a new church committee. So I thought it was important to go back and actually look at what the real church committee was. And uh, that took Tom and I back to uh, also look at who Frank Church was. And the truth is uh, fascinating. It's a fascinating story um, that has not really gotten uh, the due that it deserves. Uh, Frank Church was a senator from Idaho, a liberal Democrat from Idaho, uh, which on its own is, uh, is unusual and rare enough. Uh, he is actually the last Democrat elected to the Senate from Idaho. Uh, and he was a he was one of the youngest senators uh, ever elected. He was first elected to the Senate uh, from Idaho in, in uh, 1956 when he was just 32 years old. Uh, and he remained in the Senate, he was uh, reelected uh, four times, got elected four times and was uh, a senator until 1980. Uh, and so he saw the rise, the kind of the uh, rise of modern liberalism uh, in the 19, late 50s, early uh, 1960s, and in the, to the 1970s. And he was a, I don't think he would have understood uh, in his own mind that his legacy would be the church committee. I think he saw his legacy uh, in other ways. But today we remember him because of the committee that he ran in 1975. Uh, it was the uh, church committee. It was the first ever congressional investigation of the U.S. intelligence community. Uh, they investigated the abuses of the CIA, the FBI, the National Security Agency, and other aspects of the intelligence community. And it, it was uh, a historic investigation that went on for a year and which led to uh, most of the reforms of the intelligence community that are still in place today. And it was the historic significance of it was that it really uh, forced the US intelligence community for the very first time to operate under the rule of law. Uh, prior to the church committee, there was no congressional oversight of the intelligence community. There were no uh, intelligence committees in either the House or the Senate prior to the church committee. Uh, there were the only supervision that Congress gave to the CIA and the FBI was that the old barons of the Senate or the House would ask the CIA director what, how much money they needed 
and then tell them we don't want to know any of your secrets. And so that uh, kind of uh, relationship between uh, Congress and the CIA lasted for the first 30 years of its existence. And without any congressional oversight, the CIA began to uh, get into massive abuses of power over those 30 years. And that was Frank Church's job to uncover those uh, secret abuses. Uh, and the more he dug, the more he found out. And, the and that led to a national call for reform that led to a whole series of uh, legislative and administrative and executive changes. Uh, the changes and the reforms were so important and so uh, uh, significant that it led by, uh, it really angered the CIA, angered uh, Republicans and conservative supporters of the intelligence community, so much so that after 9-11, uh, Dick Cheney was still angry about the church committee and blamed the church committee for 9-11, uh, even though by that time the church committee had uh, been gone for 30 years and, and Frank Church had been dead for 20. Um, so I think it's it's an important story that hasn't has never gotten uh, enough attention. And Frank Church himself was a fascinating senator who started out as a fairly conventional Democrat, uh, but was radicalized by Vietnam and uh, became one of the most important anti-war leaders in Congress and really hasn't gotten enough credit uh, even today for uh, his role in forcing uh, the Nixon administration to end the war uh, because he was he was leading congressional efforts to defund uh, the Vietnam War. Uh, so maybe now I could uh, turn it over to Tom and he could talk a little bit about, about both Frank Church and about the Church Committee. Yeah, I've uh, been telling people that Senator Frank Church is the most Im important senator who you've never heard of because he was not as big and showy. He liked, you know, the spotlight, but he was not as big a showy as Lyndon Johnson, Mike Mansfield, Robert Byrd, you know, some of the three majority leaders of the Senate that he worked with during his 24 years in Congress. And each of those men were, he was kind of, you know, he was a major player in the legislative achievements of the different majority leaders that he worked with over the years. And um, like he was there for Robert, he really was there for the arc of the sentency. Um, it's interesting we uh, initially thought of doing maybe a book on uh, Senator Joe McCarthy, who was censured and had passed away. And then all of his um, supporters had fallen out of favor by 1956, which is how Senator Frank Church gets into office. You know, you see the end of a kind of a season of in, in inquisition in the Senate. And then you get, you know, the uh, more normal business, first the Democrats and Republicans, and then the Democratic ascendancy under Jimmy Carter, where they have the supermajority. And it's this, this, these 24 years are just incredibly important. They, you know, they end with the Reagan revolution and the, you know, the 19, early 1980s, where the Republicans control both seats of, you know, both houses of Congress. And so it's really the season where Frank Church is a major, major, major player. And he was not a clubbable member of the Senate. He wasn't, this is the 1950s and 60s. So, you know, old, mostly white old men, you know, doing Senator stuff. And, you know, he didn't do that. He went home, he lived in the suburbs of Bethesda, and his wife was a major part of his political career. She had been the daughter of a governor of Idaho, and so she was a major player in all of his advice that she was giving him, but including to stay away from Vietnam, you know, because it was such a toxic issue, but he was just so determined to do it. And um, he got into office on, um, you know, today we would say, you know, very, very honest politics where he wouldn't do smear campaigns, even though, you know, his McCarthy you know, supporter opponent had plenty to uh, criticize. He tried to do honest campaigning on the issues, which is also a little bit foreign for today. And, you know, he was a, a major, major player in all of the different legislative uh, things that passed through the Senate during those years. Like, that's right. He, 
he was there to see Senator Robert Byrd filibuster the Civil Rights Act. And then a decade later, when Byrd became majority leader, he was there to see him try to water down the filibuster because Byrd could see the stalemate we'd be heading for today. So he was there to see things change. And he was a major, major player in all of it, like diplomatic treaties, other legislation. You know, the church committee just towers over all of it because it's so unique in the history of Congress where there has been this committee with bipartisan support that went to the White House and said, we want to see these secret documents because the CAA reports to the pleasure of the president. They do the brief every morning and they were able to get a lot of documents. That's one of the reasons the church committee towers so much in congressional history is because they got a lot of material and they published these five voluminous five reports. Is it five? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a lot. It's voluminous reports of just all, all these documents from across the intelligence agencies. And, you know, they didn't name the names of spies. They didn't, you know, they worked hard to, like journalists, you know, they worked to uh, curate all the stuff that they got and all the interviews they did. And they made them into very effective reports. I highly recommend you look at them because all the weird stuff about our intelligence agencies came out in these committee reports. And uh, it's just really, really hard to, like, you look at the Senate torture report, for instance, from 2015, that is so heavily redacted, it's incredibly brief. But this is, you know, a comprehensive report, five of them, about all of the weirdness going on in the government when there isn't any oversight. And when uh, Carter becomes president and Democrats control both houses of Congress in uh, after 1976, then the FISA court is enacted and the House and Senate Intelligence Committees, as we know them today, be begin to exist. And there's just, you know, a huge, huge wave of legislation uh, at the, you know, that's right at the tail end of his career when he's the, the, he's not the great man of the Senate, but he's the old man of the Senate. Not quite. He was only in his 50s when he passed away, I think. But um, yeah, he was, you know, he was a mentor to young Senator Joe Biden by the end of his career. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the Watergate babies, so to speak, where all the um, new generation of Democrats are coming in. So he's there to mentor them as well. So he wasn't as well liked in the Senate as some of the other, you know, senators who could uh, kind of be clubbable and get the votes they want. But he made his presence felt a lot on the Hill. So he was a major, major figure, not just because he led the church committee. One of the one of the my favorite one of my favorite stories about Frank Church and one of the reasons I thought that The Last Honest Man was a great title uh, and a fitting title was uh, relates to his first uh, Senate campaign in 1956. As Tom said, he was running against uh, an incumbent who was a Republican ally of uh, Joe McCarthy. His name was Herman Welker. And Welker was uh, so close to McCarthy that at the time he was nicknamed uh, Little Joe from Idaho. And uh, Welker did all of the dirty work for McCarthy, or a lot of it, in the Senate. And he blackmailed another senator uh, who was a Democrat who uh, was opposed to McCarthy. And he blackmailed him by uh, finding out about his son, uh, son's homosexual uh, past and the fact that his son had been arrested in Lafayette Park in Washington uh, in an undercover uh, a police officer's uh, sting operation. And the police in Washington were going to uh, drop the charges. And Welker went to the police and demanded that they aggressively prosecute the young man. And then he went to the senator, who was a, a Lester Holt, I mean, Lester, uh, uh, his last name was Holt. Anyway, uh, they went to him and said, if you uh, don't resign from the Senate right now, we will uh, uh, advertise, we'll have your son thrown in jail and we'll advertise this all over uh, Wyoming, where this uh, senator was from. And instead, the senator uh, committed suicide. And in his office. In his office. He shot himself in his office. And this uh, inspired the book Advise and Consent, which was a big political thriller for its day. Right. And Fr Frank Church's uh, campaign staff put together some opposition research about this incident uh, and planned to distribute it all over Idaho. 
to go after uh, Herman Welker. And when Frank Church heard about it, he was horrified and he ordered that all of the pamphlets be burned in a bonfire behind his campaign headquarters in Boise. And he said, I don't want to win that way. I'm going to win on the issues. And I always thought that was a remarkable sign of uh, Frank Church's integrity, that even uh, something as despicable as what Herman Welker had done, he didn't want to use against him. Uh, so I think he's got a, uh, and, he, and he continued to do that throughout his career. He, he campaigned on the issues. And even in the 1960s in Idaho, when he turned against the war in Vietnam, his wife, as Tom said, uh, was constantly telling him not to go public with his opposition to the war. And he refused. He became the, one of the most important leading vocal critics of the war. And he had to run for re-election in 1968 in the middle of the war and in one of the most chaotic political years in American history. And he won easily because he went around the state and explained to everyone what his position was, why he had turned against the war. And the people in Idaho uh, accepted that and and uh, believed that he was being honest with them in a way that most uh, politicians uh, never do. Uh, and it's, it's really remarkable that he was able to become probably the most radical senator in Washington and still get reelected in Idaho. There were a couple of senators more liberal than him, and they got voted out in 1968. Yeah, yeah. And he uh, and he then, as I said earlier, he became the leader of the campaign to defund the war in Vietnam uh, by the early 1970s. There were a series of legislative uh, uh, moves called the Cooper Church Amendments, which uh, were efforts, incremental efforts at first to defund certain parts of the war in Southeast Asia, and then finally to defund the whole war. And those, the, those incre became increasingly popular in Congress. And the fact that they were getting close to passage meant that Nixon realized he had to accelerate the peace negotiations and get out of Vietnam. And I think that Church deserves a lot of credit for <clears throat> ending the war. And it and was he worked with you know, He yeah, worked with right. Senator John Sherman Cooper and... Um... Senator uh, Case from New Jersey. So uh, these are a couple. This is an example of bipartisanship on the issues, and uh, the party structure wasn't the same as it is today. And you could have some more. You know, things weren't as fixed as they are were today. Like it's interesting, uh, Senator. One of the things that uh, Senator Church had to do was to support gun rights or at least oppose limits on new. You know, because you know that was his gimme to the people of Idaho is that uh, people wanted their guns. And it's kind of what Charlie Wilson from the House used to say is that my district in Texas wants low taxes and guns. That's it. I get to vote yes a lot. And uh, to paraphrase, and it's kind of what Frank Church did is that he was you know, a supporter of gun rights before it was a massive, massive issue. There were shootings in the 1960s, but nothing like today, nothing as frequent as today with the weapons we have today. You know, It was not yet the, the, you know, the huge issue that it is today, but that was kind of... An example of how he was able to maneuver with Republicans, and Republicans could be in favor of union rights and still in favor of low taxes, and you know it was more fluid than it was today. So it's a different Senate, and it's just such an interesting atmosphere where he is the only real opponent in the Senate. You have to remember, nobody in the House of Representatives voted against the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution in 1964. That's like, what if everyone in Congress had voted for the war in Iraq? It's like, you know, maybe there were there were. You don't see that kind of unity today, even in the 2003 invasion of Iraq. You didn't see Obama voted against it. Like there were some people who voted against it. But this, so he was taking a big risk here by, you know, being critical of Vietnam. I think the 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 issue, the Vietnam radicalized uh, church, and so by the early 1970s, he had come to believe that the United States was turning into a militaristic empire, and as a result. He uh, believed that the U.S. intelligence community and the CIA in particular were part of this 
uh, imperial uh, growth and needed to be uh, that the CIA was sabotaging American foreign policy around the world. And that led, it was really his, the radicalization he went, underwent with Vietnam that led him to want to lead the church committee uh, and to uh, investigate the CIA. Pro the first thing he investigated was actually through a separate committee, a subcommittee of the Foreign, uh, foreign uh, Relations Committee, in which he investigated the CIA and its role with uh, ITT, the big telecommunications company, in Chile. Uh, he had he was chair of a small subcommittee about that investigated the role of multinational corporations around the world in undermining U.S. foreign policy. And the first major investigation he had was about how ITT had worked with the CIA to help overthrow Salvador Allende, the socialist president of Chile. What he didn't realize until later was that that was just the tip of the iceberg. There was a much larger CIA covert action underway in Chile to depose uh, Allende and put in place uh, Pinochet and his brutal regime. And that later became a, a, a larger part of his investigation in the church committee. But that was, that was his, uh, he, he came out of Vietnam believing that there were major forces that were largely invisible that were pushing America into endless wars. And that was, he saw the CIA as part of that and the rise of multinational corporations as another part of this uh, under kind of uh, unseen power in America that was making America more militaristic. And he gave speeches in the late 1960s and early 70s about this that are remarkable to read which he compared American foreign policy to that of the Soviet Union. And he thought that our role in Vietnam was no different from the Soviet Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1968. Uh, and he didn't see much difference uh, between um, the abuses of the Soviets in the late 60s and early 70s uh, and those of the United States. And so he was a true radical and yet he uh, kept getting elected in uh, in Idaho, which is it's just remarkable. And so it was really all of those forces came to came together in 1975 uh, when uh, the Senate was ready to investigate the CIA after a major New York Times expose of uh, CIA domestic spying in December 1974 by uh, Seymour Hirsch investigative reporter uh, that led to a major uh, kind of a political firestorm in December 1974, right after the midterm elections had given the Democrats a huge landslide victory. And it came just a few months after uh, Richard Nixon had, re had resigned and Gerald Ford was the new president. And he was very weak because he was unelected and uh, now faced a massive Democratic majorities in the House and the Senate. I don't uh, want to downplay po Ford's power. He had been Speaker of the House, but in the Senate, he had no power. That's the he'd worst. been Minority Leader. Minority Yeah. Leader. Yeah. So, and anyway, um, the Church Committee investigation, really, uh, the problem they faced when they started was, what was what are we going to investigate? There's been 30 years. The CIA has gone for 30 years without any kind of uh, oversight. So they had 30 years of abuses that they had to dig into. And the big question they faced when they started in January 1975 was, what do we investigate? And Ford, who was uh, didn't really quite know what he was doing about this, he kind of stumbled into the CIA investigation. Uh, met with the editors of the New York Times right after Hirsch's story uh, in December and uh, was telling them there are certain things that, the, that nobody should know about. There are certain secrets that should stay secret. And uh, 
the editor of the New York Times said, like what? And he said, well, like assassinations. And then he said, but that's off the record. And uh, what he was talking about was the CIA had been conducting uh, or attempting to conduct assassinations of foreign leaders uh, over the years, including Fidel Castro. And uh, the New York Times refused to run the story because Ford had told them after he blurted it out that it was off the record. So Cy Hirsch uh, leaked it to CBS News and Daniel Shore, a reporter in their Washington bureau. And so CBS broke the story that the CIA had been engaged in assassinations of foreign leaders. And when Frank Church heard about that, that became the first thing he wanted to investigate. And so they started um, a task force inside the church committee to investigate all of the efforts by the CIA over the previous decades to try to kill Fidel Castro and other foreign leaders. Uh, maybe Tom, you can pick up on that. Yeah, it became it. That was the part that got the most attention, like the the news that the CIA had partnered with the mafia to try to poison Fidel Castro before the Bay of Pigs invasion you know, ordered by Eisenhower and, you know, continued by John F. Kennedy is an example that was an example that it was Republicans and Democrats who had abused the power of the CIA because the CIA is an instrument of the executive branch and you know, the FBI becomes involved, you know, becomes a bigger part. So the, the investigation grows to all of the intelligence agencies, even naval intelligence and, you know, things that they're doing like drug tests right after World War II. And just it becomes this huge thing because all these scoops are coming out about the CIA and abuses of power and um, in different agencies. And so it just becomes a big investigation, but it mostly focuses on the assassinations of several or attap, attempts, uh, assassinations against several foreign leaders. And that gets the most attention. And um, the report is fairly critical of, you know, it doesn't say presidents have, you know, we're definitely responsible for trying to kill this person, but they definitely don't absolve them either. And so it's a pretty critical report, all things considered, even when they're pulling their punches. And it becomes this, like I said, that these reports are unprecedented. You don't get that level of intelligence information that's not redacted. And it just sets off a firestorm of, it's kind of inspires the 1970s, I don't know about Melies or whatever you want to call it, just the kind of skepticism with the government. It just follows on to Watergate. It's kind of a spiritual successor. It's not a direct spin-off of Watergate, but uh, they think they're going to be investigating Richard Nixon, and they find out that Eisenhower and even Truman and Kennedy and Johnson are all you know, misusing the power of the intelligence agencies and letting the FBI do what they want. And it's just a, such a, a watershed moment in American history because you're learning about the first half of the Cold War when there has been no oversight, and it's just unprecedented. The, ultimately, the, the assassinations of foreign leaders investigation took up most of the first part of the committee's work. And there were two other investigations, I would say, that uh, along with that are the landmark investigations. Uh, I think the three major investigations that they conducted were the assassinations of foreign leaders at the CIA, uh, the FBI's harassment and abuse of Martin Luther King Jr., and uh, an investigation uh, into the uh, National Security Agency's uh, domestic spying operations. Uh, up until that time, no one had ever looked into the NSA at all, and no one had ever been willing to investigate the FBI aggressively prior to the Church Committee. And the what we know today about all of those things is still mostly due to uh, the church committee's work. The church, if you look at what is known about how the FBI harassed uh, Martin Luther King, most of the facts uh, that we know today are still from the church committee's uh, groundbreaking, groundbreaking work. Uh, the NSA had never been, uh, there have been no congressional hearings ever uh, about the NSA prior to the church committee. And when the NSA's director testified in, in public to the uh, church committee, it was the first time any NSA director had ever testified 
uh, in public uh, to Congress, even though the agency had been uh, created in 1952. Uh, the in the uh, CIA's uh, efforts to assassinate foreign leaders led to massive changes in the way the CIA operates. Uh, the investigation uncovered the alliance, as Tom said, the alliance between the CIA and the mafia to try to kill Castro, and which has led, uh, and the, the church committee's disclosure of all of that has uh, led to many conspiracy theories over the years about whether or not the CIA, the mafia, and Castro were all somehow involved in the Kennedy assassination, uh, which, you know, Frank Church didn't believe, uh, but there were, uh, it led un inevitably to a lot of conspiracy theories. It but also it contributed and made it easier for us to get documents because Congress is so convinced, to the, you know, so determined to convince people that that was just a conspiracy theory that they declassified lots of government documents in the 90s and it made us easier you know, for us to, to research the mafia's involvement. Right, right. I, now, yeah, the, the a lot of church committee uh, documents were declassified by the Clinton administration in the 90s because there was uh, an effort to dispel the idea that there was a, a conspiracy to kill Kennedy. Uh, so it's a... Uh, it's fascinating to to read through all the uh, original reports and the the memoirs that have been written uh, about uh, by many of the people who testified before the church committee. Uh, so it's a, it's a it's also uh, since this is the Capitol Historical Society, it's worth mentioning there is a House counterpart, the House Pike Committee, and it takes the less flashy but you know maybe more significant route of following the money because the CIA and these other agencies had secret budgets and they were trying to find out what the heck have you been spending your money on. The most dramatic detail that I wish there was more context for is one CIA station in a tiny country spent $40,000 on liquor in one year. Like they looked at the bills for the first time. They had a secret budget. So they didn't get as much attention as the church committee because they're not covering assassinations. But it's really fascinating to show just how inefficient the CIA and all these other agencies were without oversight. You need oversight for someone to say, no, you shouldn't spend money on that. No, you should be doing this instead to make sure you're not screwing around. And, you know, there hadn't been a lot of reporting on that before. So we delved into that. I, I talked to the one who um, had written most of the report and um, Ford did have power in the house, like I said, because he was able to stop the publication of that report, but it was leaked once again to Daniel Shore. Was it Daniel Shore again? Yes. And he's a busy man. He got the Pike report. And uh, so it was eventually published, you know, outside the United States as like an academic journal, but it has not been published by Congress yet. So uh, that was, we, we delved into that a little bit more, but both of the church and the Pike committees were discredited. Like data, you know, Jim had said that uh, Cheney blamed the church committee for 9-11, which is the CIA had done its job. They had collected information about the war in Iraq, you know, ahead of the war in Iraq and ahead of the, the, you know, U.S. involvement in Vietnam, that it was a bad idea. So even when the CIA does his job, the president doesn't always listen, just to give that some context. But they've been maligned, the House and Senate investigations, and we tried to give some more context to dispel that, because there's a lot of people who think that it was an incredibly, incredibly valuable moment in the history of U.S. intelligence. One of the things that, uh, you know, the Church Committee operated for throughout 1975, and uh, began to hold public hearing. It had closed hearings for most of the first few months, and then had began public hearings in the fall of 1975. And it uh, was completing its work in December 1975 when, uh, and had been very uh, popular with the public. All of its work had uh, been met with uh, a lot of interest. But then in December 1975, the CIA station chief in Athens was assassinated by uh, uh, Greek terrorists. And the, the Ford administration and the CIA tried to latch on to that and blame Frank Church and the Church Committee for the death, claiming that it had uh, leaked uh, too much information 
uh, and that that led to the assassination, which was a complete lie uh, because they had never talked about uh, Richard Welch, the CIA station chief, uh, and then hadn't investigated uh, anything related to him. And I, we talked to the, the man, the deputy station chief, uh, who was still alive, who uh, said that he reported back uh, to CIA headquarters the truth about why uh, Welch had been assassinated and uh, that it all related to specific things going on in Athens and in Greece and had nothing to do with anything else. And the CIA and the Ford administration ignored those reports and continued to blame the church committee. And it was very useful propaganda by the Ford White House because right then they, they had just fired uh, William Colby, the CIA director, be, because he had been too cooperative with the church committee. And they were, and Ford had just nominated George Bush to be CIA director. Uh, and they wanted to get his confirmation through the Senate. But Frank Church was opposed to Bush's nomination because uh, Bush had been the uh, head of the Republican National Committee during Watergate and had been an apologist for Nixon during Watergate. And uh, Church said, we don't need a political uh, puppet at the CIA right now. And to fight back against uh, Church in the Senate for in the confirmation battle over Bush, uh, the Ford White House used Welch's murder to say that Church was irresponsible and that uh, the Church Committee had uh, harmed American national security, which was a complete lie, but they uh, were successful in getting Bush confirmed and then also in trying to discredit the Church Committee's work. And so that's one, one of the uh, depressing side effects of this was, of, of the Church Committee really was the rise of Republican uh, disinformation campaigns. It was really very much like what you've seen in the last few years from Trump and uh, his uh, supporters trying to use the intelligence community for disinformation and propaganda. I see we got a question here uh, about uh, did the church committee look into the CIA's role deposing our Benz in Guatemala? No, but uh, learning about all that, we read every scrap of information we could get about the CIA in the first half of the Cold War that would, you know, complement the church reports and complement what they were looking into and what was going on at the time. Uh, because Frank Church was also on the Foreign Relations Committee, let's not forget, that was his big, his goal was to be chairman of the House of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and he eventually was. So he's involved with, you know, he does two investigations of Chile in 1975, one with ITT, as Jim mentioned, and another on the, the church committee. But they don't look into the Arbenz coup in Guatemala, which I think deserve more attention because there's actually U.S. fighter planes that are bombing Guatemala in that coup. And I think, but yeah, they, we, we spoke with people who worked on the committee and they said they had to focus and they're not wrong because they had a year and that they got an extension because in the Senate, they're able to do that. And in the House, House by committee is not able to get an extension that same way. But Frank Church and Senator John Tower, the two, you know, bipartisan chairs of the church committee, and they are able to get an extension. But even with that, they have to tie it off and do some hearings and do the reports. And they can't just dig and dig and dig for everything. But I would have loved to see some more attention to Guatemala. One of the one of the problems they had was that as they were investigating the CIA, uh, they were getting more and more cooperation over the months from Colby, the head of the CIA. But the one area that the CIA did not want them to investigate, and the one the main pushback they got was on investigating covert action operations, uh, and so they had to pick and choose which ones they could do. Uh, there were so many covert action operations like Guatemala, like Iran. Uh, and so they focused uh, on Chile. 
And it was the only, they did five, and they investigated five covert action operations, uh, but they agreed with the board, White House, and the CIA that they would only hold public hearings on one, and that was on Chile. And even on that one, the CIA refused to cooperate and refused to send any uh, officials to testify. I think they might have had more success if they had dug into Guatemala because that was far away enough that they wouldn't be as worried about the fallout. Right. Like when uh, the LSD drug and torture tests come out, MK Ultra, they're kind of just ready to drop it and say, hey, we weren't there or hey, this wasn't our fault. But Chile is so recent. It's still happening when this is this is 1975. So it's so fresh that people are just trying to keep you away. So right. maybe if they because the worst stuff and the craziest stuff happened in the 50s for the FBI. Well, the FBI stuff happened. COINTELPRO Pro happened in the 1960s. And Hoover's dead by that point. So everyone is ready to roll over on Hoover. So they don't have this problem with the FBI because Hoover's gone finally. And the yeah, second he goes, good. the Senate and House pass term limits on the FBI. So there will never be another Hoover. And um, yeah, that I, was one of the that was one of the reasons they were able to do the Martin Luther King investigation was because Hoover had just died a couple of years earlier. But on the Senate, like Chile is so recent that it's a, it's a tough pick for church because it's it's more relevant. It's more headline grabbing. It has more impact, but it's also harder to get people to talk to you about it in the same way that it would have been if you like Alan Dulles is dead, too. So you can blame him for everything. And I do <laughs> for the 1950s and early 60s. But yeah, so that's the challenge when you're doing a congressional committee. Who is still, who could still be impacted by your investigations? Are they gone? Uh, are they out of office? You know, but it was Frank Church was a pretty bold lawmaker, and I think that he made a huge impact. Right. There are other questions. So, someone asked the question about. Uh, some assert that. Uh, Senator Church's focus on foreign relations and the CIA contributed to his defeat in 1980 because mm -hmm. he'd been so focused on that that he hadn't been taking care of business at home. You want to opine on that matter? Yeah, there's some truth to that. He, uh, as I said, he in the 1960s and early 70s, he had, he turned against the war in Vietnam and he still get, getting reelected in Idaho. His wife had been, who was a very politically astute, and uh, as Tom said, was the daughter of a Democratic governor of Idaho, had warned him against turning against Vietnam uh, because she thought it would harm him in uh, Idaho. But it, he refused to, uh, to give in on that, and he turned out to be right. He was reelected in 1968, uh, even though he was then uh, very vocal about his opposition to the war. And then he was reelected again in 1974 uh, when he was uh, right after right after the end of the war. And uh, he had been uh, leading the Cooper Church amendments throughout the early 1970s to, to defund the war. But by 1980, Idaho was becoming more conservative than it had been. Uh, it's hard to realize that for a long time, Idaho was almost like a purple state, what we would now call a purple state. It was uh, it was sort of a swing state for a long time. Big union presence. Yeah, there had been large unions, especially in North Idaho. Uh, and Franklin Roosevelt won Idaho four straight in four straight presidential elections. And then for, uh, Harry Truman won it again in 1948. And there were a whole series of Democratic governors and senators and uh, congressmen uh, over the years from Idaho. But in the 1970s, as the mines and the timber operations began to uh, shut down and had layoffs, uh, North, Northern Idaho in particular began to change. Uh, North Idaho was the ba Democratic base for Frank Church and for Democrats. And it became much more, slowly became much more conservative. Uh, and the rest of the state uh, became very conservative. And in, 19, in the late 1970s, Church became, after the Church Committee, he became chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And he became the leader, even before he was chairman, he became the leader of the Senate effort to 
passed the Panama Canal Treaty that Jimmy Carter uh, was pushing. And it was very unpopular among Republicans. Uh, and uh, it's hard to remember exactly why today. It was it was kind of the Benghazi issue of its day. It's, it was just unpopular because it was unpopular. People thought it was somehow a sign of uh, a loss of sovereignty, even though today no one remembers this issue. Uh, and Church decided to be the floor manager for the Panama Canal Treaty, even though his aides told him that was going to cost him in uh, Idaho. He decided to do it anyway because he thought it was the right thing to do. And it was probably the Panama Canal Treaty more than anything uh, that uh, harmed him in the 1980 election. But the, the biggest problem was uh, in 1980 was that Jimmy Carter was running for re-election against Ronald Reagan. And Jimmy Carter was very unpopular in uh, Idaho at the time. And uh, Ronald Reagan was very popular. Uh, in 1980, uh, Carter, I think his popularity, one poll we uh, saw, he had an approval rate of 26% in Idaho. Uh, but Frank Church still almost won re-election. He only lost by 4,000 votes. And a lot of Democrats still blame the fact that Jimmy Carter conceded early on the night, uh, on the election night in 1980, and uh, didn't didn't seem to it kind of ignored the fact that North Idaho Church's base is in the uh, western uh, uh, time zone and not in the mountain time zone. And so uh, people were still going to the polls uh, in North Idaho and the uh, a lot of pundits say they they didn't the turnout went way down because Carter had conceded in uh, the Coeur d'Alene area. And he lost by 4,000 votes. And uh, so it was, it depends on who you talk to exactly uh, what the cause of the 1980 defeat was, but certainly his opposition to the, uh, I mean, his support for the Panama Canal Treaty and uh, was, was a major issue. We've got two questions that were sort of lightning rod, last, last questions. Um, in the promotional, there was talk about the mafia um, and you mentioned it briefly, but could you expand a little bit more on that? And then yeah. could you identify, is there one moment that radicalized uh, Senator Church about Vietnam and started him on this path? I think that the, uh, I think that his trip to Vietnam in 1960 or 1961 uh, he goes to, this is because the United States has built South Vietnam. We were the main diplomatic and financial sponsor after they were created in the 50s, which basically set it up for a civil war. And he goes there and he sees just the really aloof leadership of the Saigon government. And he had been in World War II in China when Chiang Kai-shek was in charge. And he recognized the same style of capital city, just dictating to the farmers and the peasants in the countryside. And they're all really angry about it. They're being forced into these like strategic hamlets. And he goes there and he says, all of them are being forcibly relocated to these camps and they're not happy about it. And they're not going to be safe from the guerrillas, you know, in the Viet Cong. So he just thinks the whole situation is doomed after he actually goes to Vietnam. I think that's the big moment. And we talk about that in the book. And yeah. on the mafia, I think, uh, no, it wasn't. It was mostly, it was isolated to the CIA efforts and assassinations, specifically the plot to kill Fidel Castro. Um, but it was the most dramatic of the pieces because these, you know, t one of the the mob bosses who he was, Sam Giancana, who was, you know, was going to be uh, interviewed for the committee was killed before he could testify. And there's another um, gangster who was a go-between for the CIA and the mafia who was interviewed. And uh, they talked about uh, how he had, Past poison pills, and they tried to figure out, you know, just the connection between what did the connect, what did the Kennedys know, and uh, what were they, you know, it turns in our book we determined that they, they did know, but yeah, it was limited to the plots to kill Castro. It was uh, Sam Giancana was the mob boss of uh, Chicago, 
when he got involved with the plot to kill Castro uh, with the CIA. Johnny Rosselli was the other gangster uh, from Los Angeles and Las Vegas who got involved with the mafia, I mean, with the CIA. Uh, Rosselli and Giancana then uh, tried to get uh, Santo Traficante, the boss of uh, in Florida, uh, involved. And so they all agreed to go to Miami Beach with a former FBI agent who was the uh, contractor to the CIA who was running this operation. And uh, Giancana and uh, Rosselli and Traficante kept trying to, they claimed anyway, that they tried to get poison pills to uh, into Cuba to somebody close to Castro to kill him, but it never worked. Uh, and then as Tom said, Sam, Sam Giancana, when he was asked to testify before the church committee, he was shot in his own house and murdered. And then uh, Johnny Rosselli, after he testified, was uh, chopped up and put in a barrel uh, and his body was found uh, off of, uh, in Biscayne Bay off of Miami Beach. And so uh, two of the two gangsters involved with the, uh, who had testified before the church committee were, or were about to testify were murdered. Gives you a whole new perspective on testifying in front of Congress, doesn't it? Right. Um, right. We also disclosed that uh, Orlando Latalia, who was the Chilean dissident, did also testified to the church com before the church committee, but Pinochet, uh, the Chilean dictator, uh, had him car bombed in I think Dupont Circle, and um, he was working for a think tank, and that was so as previously undisclosed is that he was killed. You know Henry Kissinger had passed along, you know information that he was going to testify at the Church Committee to Pinochet, and Pinochet had him killed. So that's been undisclosed that you know the reason behind the car bombing. So that was uh, something that we scooped for the book. So there's three witnesses who were killed, not just two. Well. Jim, Tom, obviously this book has really captured your imagination and, and is something that folks are really now going to be delving into. Um, and we really so appreciate your spending the time to really bring the church committee to life and Senator Church, because we do think that one of our roles here at the Capitol Historical Society is to tell the story of the work of the Congress and the church committee was fundamental in establishing congressional oversight over the CIA and our intelligence community. And we certainly see the impact of that as we move forward. Um, I look forward to getting more deeply into the book. I only looked at the beginning and the end um, in order to do this, but I must acknowledge that, but I now am determined to get it read. So this will be, um, it's been recorded. It will be available on our website, um, on our YouTube channel. And we so appreciate the two of you donating your time to come and talk with our folks. As we always say, these, these opportunities are only available because of the support of our members and friends. Thank you for contributing to the Capitol Historical Society. Thank you for sharing these opportunities with friends and neighbors. Um, and we hope that you will join us for the next uh, series coming up. Um, we've got the promotional screen that tells us about the next thing, Sam. Well, we don't have it yet. Um, here we go. Okay. Um, so coming up, Next week is the 17th Amendment. It's part of our series of looking at the constitutional amendments, what was going on at the time, why was the amendment passed, and what's been the impact. Uh, this is the direct election of senators with Senate historian Dr. Catherine Scott. And then we have a fun one about monuments. Um, what do we what do we have as monuments? Why do we have monuments? Uh, and Rafi Adonai has identifies himself as a celebrity historian. He tries to make some, make history fun. And so it's gonna be a quiz interactive. It'll be interesting to see 
how he presents that coming up on April 4th. And toward the end of the month, we have the 10th architect of the Capitol, Alan Hantman, uh, with his book, Politics, Crisis, and Architecture at the United States Capitol called Under the Dome. And Alan Hantman was there for the building of the Capitol Visitor Center. And he describes that entire process um, and all the ins and outs. And so it is 100% worth uh, joining us for that conversation if you are a real aficionado of the Capitol itself. Thank you so very much for being with us. We're grateful to have you. Jim, Tom, thank you. Thank you for writing this book. Thank you for sharing this conversation. Uh, we look forward to the paperback coming out um, and we're happy to have you as part of the Capital History team. Be well, have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day.